Connection. Visible? Yes, sir, it is visible. Visible, sir. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I would have very much liked to visit the college and see all of you in person. But unfortunately, the coronavirus prevents all of this. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is uh, discuss a little bit about the coronavirus. And I'm going to tell you a little history and a little chemical biology. I'm going to discuss how the virus was discovered, what are the key chemical components of the virus, and how does the virus enter our cells. I'm not going to talk about how is the virus detected, how does the immune system react to infection by the virus. Dr. Professor Balram? Yes. Uh, sorry for interrupting. I think the yeah. voice is not clear, so I would like to clear, check. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I would like. Clear, uh, to... Voice is clear, Joyce. It's clear, sir. All right, because yeah, I am getting yeah, several yeah. calls here, so I just check. All right. Sorry, sorry, sir, for interrupting. Please continue. Yeah. And the last is, what are the approaches to developing therapeutics and vaccines? I won't discuss the last three points, which I have colored red. But they're extremely important in trying to understand the infection which surrounds us today. Now, the coronavirus itself is uh, a public health nightmare, but it's an artist's delight. And if you go to the Internet, you will find all the images of the coronavirus here colored beautifully. And one common feature of the virus is it's spherical and it has these spiky projections on its surface. Hello. Hello. It, it, it would be wonderful if uh, everybody muted their microphones, because otherwise I hear telephones. Uh, there is a definition of a virus which I will show you on the next slide, and that definition is that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped in a protein. Now look at how much the coronavirus has inspired everybody. It has inspired policemen in India. It has inspired auto rickshaw drivers in India. It has inspired cooks and chefs in Italy and in France, who have now put the physical replica of the coronavirus onto cakes Easter eggs, and so forth. Now, a word about viruses. Now, viruses exist wherever life is found. And in fact, one of the largest reservoirs of viruses is the sea. Uh, and I draw your attention to a review which appeared some 15 years ago in Nature, which says that viruses can move between marine and terrestrial reservoirs raising the specter of emerging pathogens. So we should always be prepared to be confronted by viruses because they're all around us. There isn't very much of a point in being terribly afraid of them. Viruses are by and large small objects. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the size of the objects. But there are some very, very large viruses which have been discovered. And this slide just illustrates two of them. One discovered not too long ago, a few years ago, in a cooling tower is called a mini virus. And that has a very large genome. And it has as many as seven, 979 proteins. More recently, in 2011, a virus from the ocean called the megavirus now is reported to have 1,120 proteins. These are huge viruses. They are, in fact, monstrous viruses. So far, none of them have been shown to be pathogenic to human beings. Look at the dimensions of these spherical particles, 750 nanometers and 680 nanometers. So that gives you an idea of scale. In biology, in physics, in chemistry, it is very important to have ideas of scales, length scales, time scales, uh, energy scales, and so forth. 
there are a huge number of viruses in the sea. And I hope that some of you are able to go and look at this article. You can see that if you assume the volume of the oceans, then the average abundance of viruses is about 3 billion viruses in a liter of ocean water. Therefore, our ocean waters now contain a staggering number of viral particles. And the rest of it tells you how much of carbon by weight exists in the form of virus. So viruses are very common. It's actually came along. Are viruses living? Biologists will generally exclude viruses from the tree of life. We will consider back archaea and eukaryotic organisms. All animals, plants fall into the eukaryotic organisms class. So unicellular organisms and multicellular organisms. But viruses are not living because they cannot reproduce. They can reproduce only within the constraints of a host cell. So they need to find a host to infect, and only then can they multiply. Now, viruses are important because viruses can exchange genes across the super kingdoms of life. So if you analyze the human genome, for example, you will find in the human genome, you will see that there are embedded in the viral genome relics of viral genes which human beings have encountered over millions and millions of years of evolution. So we have coexisted with viruses for a very long time. But here is the definition of a virus. And this I have taken really from a New York Times article, which starts with this definition, but does not say from which book the definition was taken. So I searched the literature and it's very easy to do it today on the computer, and found that this is a quote taken from Peter Medawar's book, Aristotle to Zeus. This is a book that everybody should read. It's a philosophical dictionary of biology. That is its subtitle. And every biological uh, term is actually defined in half a page or one page. And what Medawar says here is that Inasmuch as viruses are made known only by their causing disease or other pathological changes, the existence of benign viruses having no ill effects remains conjectural. No good. And then he says, it has been well said that a virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. We are going to look at the covering of the coronavirus towards the end of the talk. But this is an excellent definition of a virus. Generally bad news, always wrapped up in protein. The last point, which is general, are the length and time scales that one considers in chemistry and biology. You must look at the internet. You will find many, many pictures. I've just taken one of them, which will tell you what are the kind of length scales we are talking about and what are the time scales of rotation and so forth associated with these objects. Right in the middle of this slide is a virus. You can recognize it as the spherical object that you see. That virus would be somewhere roughly 100 nanometers and maybe 600 nanometers for the larger viruses. Professor Balram, sorry to interrupt you again. Yeah. Uh, there is a problem yeah. with YouTube. Can I make one announcement, please? Uh, dear all, there is a problem with YouTube live streaming. We have generated a new link. The link will be sent to the WhatsApp groups and also on, on the chat box. Kindly use that link and join again in the new YouTube link that is sent to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Should yes, I sir. Yes, sir. You could continue. Now, this slide tells you one important fact about the coronavirus. It is an enveloped virus. And the meaning of the enveloped virus means that the surface of the virus has a phospholipid membrane. You can see it in the structure 
was the little yellow balls on the right hand side of the slide, the little yellow balls, this somewhat larger blue projections which stick out through the membrane. That's protein. But those yellow balls are the head groups of the phospholipid and then you have the hydrocarbon tails. So it's a bilayer membrane, just like all biological cells. And this is one reason why the virus is so sensitive to soap. And uh, when you wash your hands with soap, really what you're doing is you're dissolving the envelope of the virus and therefore viral integrity is now lost. But this is nothing new. William Osler, one of the founding fathers of modern medicine, many years ago, I think more than a hundred odd years ago, wrote in an article that so and common sense are the best respect to enveloped viruses. This is one of the most detailed schematic pictures of the virus that I have found in the literature. And you can see the brown spikes. We're going to talk about those brown spikes. But then you can see other small blue objects. You can see yellow heads. All of these embedded on the surface of the virus. The surface of the virus is very important because that's what our cells see when the virus first approaches them. And today with the power of supercomputing, this kind of simulation to get pictures like this can very easily be done. But I'm now going to tell you a little history. How were these viruses originally uh, characterized? This is an interesting paper. Read the title. It says the morphology of three previously uncharacterized human respiratory viruses that grow in organ culture. What it means is that if you have some infectious material from a human being, and you expose animal organ cultures, the viruses will grow in these, and then you can isolate the virus. And once the virus is isolated, you might try and characterize it in under light microscopes, but under an electron microscope, you can actually see them. The center of this slide shows you the electron micrographs of the first coronavirus which was characterized. On the left is David Tyrell, who headed the research program. And on the right is June Almeida, who was the electron microscope microscopist who took this picture. So after the epidemic started, this picture appeared in the National Geographic magazine. It appeared in the BBC. And after that, it appeared in almost every magazine and newspaper. And David Tyrell and June Almeida were now called the discoverers of the coronavirus. At this time, sometime in the month of April, I began to read the literature and I read this paper. And then I found that they had written something here, which I've marked and read. He says probably the most interesting finding from these experiments was that two human respiratory viruses, 229E, and B814 are morphologically identical with avian infectious bronchitis virus. So they've, they've now seen two morphologically similar viruses which look like avian virus. And this is how they characterized the virus. They used organ cultures, grew these viruses, and after they got the viruses, they took the electron micrographs, which gave them the picture that I showed you. Look at the legend. It says this type of particle was seen when organ cultures infected with strain 229E were examined by the present technique. They mean electron microscopy. 229E now, if you go up the slide, is a strain reported by two people called Hamre and Prochno in 1966. So it is actually Dorothy Hamre, who was the principal author of this paper, who should, who discovered the first coronavirus, 229E. And this picture is taken, if you look at the bottom of the slide, they thank Dr. Hamre for supplying the 229E virus. 
by the time i read this we were in lockdown and when you're in lockdown all that you can do is stare at the computer and try to google away so i went back to the literature and typed to google and typed in the term dorothy hanbury to find out whether i could find a picture of her which i could put on the slide that i just showed you so that she could get proper credit for having discovered the coronavirus but what i found really was that there were a number of scientific papers written by her all of them very well cited which appear in the google uh, search but there are no images there are no images of anybody who matches the a virologist there are other dorothy hambrays but they're clearly different people so i did not find any photograph but i did now search the literature using google scholar and pubmed and then i found that she was a very productive scientist beginning in bacteriology in 1941 transitioning to virology and having a publishing career spanning the period 1941 to 1972 yet no photograph of her was found on the internet so i asked the question who was dorothy hampton further searches established that she did a book on rhinoviruses which are the viruses which caused the common cold in 1968 i also found that she had worked at the squibb institute for biomedical research and this is more of a lesson to students who are searching for something in the scientific literature you must keep searching when you don't find something i typed in the names dorothy hamry and squib and lo and behold i got a hit which was to archives in arizona it's at the North, northern arizona university in their archives i found a connection to two people called dorothy hamry and kenneth brownley i went and looked at the photographs which were there online as digital images and they are the photographs which i show you at the bottom they are pictures of wonderful beautiful natural scenery in the american southwest but i knew that i had found dorothy hamre because it was written here that she had served as an associate in this excuse me professor yes yeah i think you have to share the screen again it's not uh, coming not coming now yeah it it got interrupted okay i'll stop sharing yeah and Let's one thing yeah and go back once again let me try okay i started again tell me if it okay. is coming one minute sir Yeah, I started. Started. Just, okay. Just a minute. No. Oh, no, again it. Uh, yeah, just one second. Yeah. Do it once more. Has it come on? No, sir. It's about the rhino viruses. Yes, it's got no, the rhino viruses. Yes, sir. Right, sir. it's coming. Thank you. So you can see a book on rhino viruses on the top left, which is a book that she wrote, and at the bottom are some photographs that I have now found in an archives in Arizona. But eventually, I wrote an email to the archives in Arizona, got in touch with a young lady who, through the lockdown, and Arizona is quite affected, she went to the archives and looked at what they had, and they found that they had a lot of old photographs which they had never looked at, and from those photographs and from other places, I now discovered Dorothy Hamre in person, and. 
At the bottom of the slide is a photograph taken in the 1960s at the University of Chicago, where she actually discovered the rhinovirus. Uh, in 1950, she did very important work on antiviral agents at the Squibb Institute. And you can see her picture there. Uh, this is something that many of you should look at because in a 1950s picture in the United States, you can see there are very, very few women in science at that time. And there she is, surrounded now by a large number of white gentlemen. So I now had her picture, so I went back and remade my slide. So now the discoverers of the coronavirus are quite rightfully uh, Dorothy Henry, who found 229E, David Tyrell, who actually now took these viruses and began to examine them under the electron microscope, and June Almeida, who was the electron microscopist, who actually found the first picture. The term coronavirus comes from the fact that if you look at that electron micrograph carefully, you will find that those spikes are visible. They are like a halo. My pointer goes around, they are like a halo around the spherical viral particle. That's where the term corona comes from. Now, this is the paper of Dorothy Hamrays, which is the first coronavirus paper appearing in 1966 in the literature, and it's the first demonstration that the virus is a human pathogen. This is a wonderful paper because it is in this paper that she establishes that if you use DNA synthesis inhibitors, the virus continues to grow, and therefore it is an RNA virus. Even more importantly, she shows that the virus is sensitive to ether, and so it must have a membrane. And lastly, she estimates using filtration the size of the virus as 89, in those days, millimicrons. Now we would say 89 nanometers. This strain 229E is largely responsible only for relatively mild upper respiratory tract infections. However, as recently as 2018, there is a rare case of a human being who's got acute respiratory distress syndrome, the same kind of thing that you get with the current coronavirus, but what has been discovered is the virus 229E. So after that, you can see that once you've got, you can see that the dimensions of the virus are now established, 800 to 1200 angstrom, very, very close to the uh, dimensions which Dorothy Hamre reports in her paper. Those projections that you see roughly are about 200 angstrom long, and the head that you see is about 100 angstrom. So from these, you can get a fairly good idea of what the spherical virus really looks like. But in order to grow these cultures in those days, it was not easy. If you read experimental procedures carefully, you will find that they use the method of organ culture, nasal epithelium. In 1968, a group of scientists wrote a letter to nature, which nature recognizes as a news item. They say that a new group of viruses called coronaviruses have been recognized. So 68 is when the term coronavirus entered the scientific literature. By 1975, the coronavirus had been formally named. But in 1996, now, a quarter of a century or more later, David Terrell summarizes. He says, coronaviruses cause acute, mild, upper respiratory infection, common cold. And therefore, coronaviruses were thought of as relatively mild viruses, which did not merit too much of interest. Why were these people interested in looking at cold viruses? Because it turns out that in England after the Second World War, one of the major causes of absenteeism from work was that people reported that they had colds. 
And therefore, the search was on for a cold vaccine. And David Tyrell was the leader in this kind of research. And he had what is called a common cold unit. And this was a uniquely British venture where volunteer members of the public stayed for two weeks. Virtually no payment as human guinea pigs. And then this review adds that probably no other country could such altruism be found. If you get a chance, you must look at this book, The Cold Wars, which is where Tyrell summarizes. So that this work. is not video, but. Pardon me? Uh, does someone have a question? Okay. Now, if you can still see the slides, these are just historical slides. This is what the Common Code Research Unit looked like. And they would ask for volunteers to get 10 days holidays free. And what would happen is you would be infected with nasal secretions from someone who had a cold. And then once you caught the cold, they would take more secretions from your nasal tracts and try to isolate viruses from that. This was difficult work, and it is this kind of work which gave us all our early knowledge of coronaviruses. After 1996, relatively little appeared until 2003. I will come to 2003. But in 2020, this is the paper that started it all. It appeared online on the 3rd of February 2020. It appeared in print on March 12, 2020. And it reports the genomic analysis of a virus isolated from a patient at Wuhan. And they claim that the RNA sample was taken on the 26th of December 2019. And once the viral genome had been determined, it consisted of 29,903 nucleotides. And this is the genome that everybody is now analyzing. This and all the related viral genomes as mutations have accumulated. Now, the rest of my presentation is going to be about the coronavirus. And I'm going to tell you some details of the coronavirus. Why do I tell you these details? This is because the coronavirus is now considered an enemy. And it is really an enemy to the entire human race at present. Therefore, I thought one justification for this are these words which are from the movie Godfather 2, where Al Pacino in his character as Michael Corleone says this, he says, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. So scientists generally have their favorite topics, which are their friends, and they study them. They usually don't look at other subjects. But it is important now that the coronavirus has caused so much damage that we must know everything possible about the coronavirus if we are eventually to be successful in controlling it. But having been trained in chemistry, I thought the first thing that one should might look at is what is the molecular mass of this virus? It has 29,903 nucleotides in its genome. And if you go back to the literature, approximately 45 years ago, this paper appeared, which takes the molecular weight of the nucleic acid, dry molecular weight of the particle, and uh, the dry mass of the particle. And then you can see that you can actually estimate what it might actually be. And on the next slide, with today's techniques, you might actually do an even better job. You can use many methods. Uh, mass spectrometry is one of them, which is now able to measure very large objects. Here, for example, is cowpea mosaic virus. It has a molecular weight of 3,940 kilodaltons. And you can see that's what it is. It's 3.94 million Daltons. But the bacteriophage, which infects bacteria, is even larger. And exact masses cannot be measured, but more or less reasonable masses can be measured by these methods. For those of you who are in the chemistry department, 
you will remember that the mass of a hydrogen atom is one Dalton. So this tells you what the chemical complexity of the virus really would be. But now turning our attention back to the coronavirus, microscopic techniques have improved enormously. They've improved beyond anybody's imagination. No one in 1967, when June Almeida took the first picture, could have imagined what electron microscopy would be like in the 21st century. But now you have electron cryo microscopy, which allows you to image particles at very high resolutions, in fact, approaching near atomic resolution. Now, the particle diameters, which are estimated now in this 2006 paper for the coronavirus, is between 82 and 94 nanometers is the mean particle diameter. Dorothy Hanley's measurement was 89 nanometers. So you can see she was right there in the middle of this range. This tells you that the scientists working in the 1960s did their experiments very, very carefully. And although the techniques that they used might look primitive by today's standards, much of what they learned has held true even when our techniques have become so much more sophisticated. One can measure many things here. You can see the bilayer much more clearly, those yellow balls, small balls, and those indistinct lines, which is the lipid bilayer. The separation between these head groups is 3.8 nanometers. You can measure the length of these projections. All of that has been done, and slowly, a very much more precise picture of the organization of the virus is emerging. But those of you who look at dates, and I suspect many people don't look at dates carefully. This is why I put the, the word history in my title, because history is very important. You must know where things have come from and when. Only then can you assess what is happening at the present. This paper appeared in 2006. And now you can ask, why were people studying this in 2006? After all, we're having the problem in 2020. In 2003, there was the first SARS outbreak. This was because of coronavirus 1. The virus which we are confronted with today is SARS-CoV-2. It's coronavirus 2. But on the 28th of February 2003, there was a call to the offices of the Hanoi offices of the World Health Organization saying that you had a patient with unusual influenza like symptoms. And could some specialist in infectious disease come and take a look at the patient? Dr. Carlo Urbani of the WHO answered this call for help. He immediately recognized that here was a suddenly dangerous virus and he isolated the patient and he quickly brought in isolation met methods to the hospital. But it turned out that by that time he was infected. Not only was he infected, but many of the nurses and medical staff who looked after the patient were also infected. And on March 11th, by the time he got to Bangkok with all these reports, he told a colleague from the Center for Disease Control not to come near him. And then he struggled for the next 18 days, and he died at the end of March 2003. So you can see that from infection to death was very short, and he wasn't an old person. He was a relatively young and vigorous man. This was a very virulent virus. It had 8,098 infected people, 774 deaths. But it was very quickly controlled. It was very quickly controlled because the outbreak came from south, southern China and then went to Vietnam. There was not much international travel from these places, and therefore it did not have the opportunity to spread to other parts of the world. It was at this time that scientists really began to study the coronavirus in some detail. And this 2006 paper is really based on uh, the 2003 uh, coronavirus epidemic. So we are getting better and better at understanding the virus. 
This brown spike is what is called a spike glycoprotein, and I'm going to come back to that. These blue objects here are the membrane protein M. These spherical purple balls are now the nucleocapsid protein N. And then you would have another small protein, which is an envelope protein, which is not quite clearly shown on this slide, but you can see it. You would have also seen some small particles in that uh, wonderful uh, simulation that I showed you on an earlier slide. There are many proteins in the coronavirus, but a relatively small number, 16, 20 proteins would be all that one needs to know about. Now we can use our data and do some calculations. If the particle has 100 nanometers diameter, we might ask now, we know what's inside, we know roughly what the molecular weight would be, what would be the mass of a viral particle? The mass of a viral particle, which might be estimated, is 10 to the minus 15 grams. This might be off by a factor of 10. So it might be 10 to the minus 16 grams, which would be about 100 atograms. This would be one femtogram. So a very, very small particle. You see the discussions in the newspapers on how far the particle can spread and so on. If you have droplets, and that's the current discussion, and the droplet sort of, uh, the water in the droplet sort of evaporates in the air, then of course you will have naked viral particles. And these might go much further carried on. They might go with aerosols also. So these are extremely small particles. Anybody who's trying to get rid of them by uh, flushing roads and cars and tires and so forth, isn't likely to completely eliminate uh, viruses altogether. Now let's look at just one protein. What gives the coronavirus its name? This is the corona of the coronavirus, the halo around the viral particle. This is a protein and it is three molecules of a protein which sort of twine around one another to give a trimeric structure. This is the head of the protein is the bulb, then you have a stalk, and then I won't go into these technicalities. You have portions of the sequence which are very important for later function. This is a very big protein. It has as many as in different coronaviruses, anywhere from 1100 to 1500 residues. So it has a mass which is very large, about 150 kilodaltons, when it is not glycosylated, about 200 kilodaltons when it is glycosylated. Many things must happen. This spike protein is the most important element for the coronavirus to detect the cell that it is going to infect. So if it's now going to land on a cell in the lung and infect it and get inside, it is this that the cell will recognize. The receptor binding domains are in the head of the stock protein. Many other events need to happen. And uh, I won't describe them in any detail. The receptor binding domain is right here at, the, at one end of the protein, which is the end terminus end of the protein. There are other proteins. The M protein, which was the blue schematic in the figure, looks like this. It's mostly through the membrane and much of it comes into the virus. Once it comes into the virus, it will bind to other proteins. Eventually, the interior of the virus is extremely well organized. This is the small protein and you need to put all of these together eventually. And you begin to see the kind of picture that I have in the bottom left of this slide. So it's a tightly packed viral interior with proteins and the purple protein, which is the nucleocapsid protein, now covers the ribonucleic acid genome. The RNA genome is now covered by that protein. And if this entire particle manages to get into the cell, it gets uncoated, the genomic RNA is released, and then replication of the virus begins inside the host cell. So this is the biological 
phenomenon that happens. So it is very important for viruses to fuse with cells. But cells also are covered by a membrane. The virus is also covered by a membrane with proteinaceous projections. How do these two come together? They must come together. So you have two bilayers, and for these two bilayers to come together, there will be a large energy barrier. Look at the bottom left of my slide. I have taken this from an article in the literature, a wonderful article. We are looking at two bilayers eventually ending up being fused. What, what do I have along the vertical axis? Along the vertical axis, I have energy. So for those of you who are students of chemistry, you will immediately realize that this is just like the reaction profile for any ordinary chemical reaction where substance A gets transformed into substance B. You have one thing on your left, another thing on your right, and then you will climb an energy barrier. The rate of this chemical reaction will depend on the height of the barrier. And you would have studied the Arrhenius rate equation, where the there will be an exponential, and then in that exponential, you will have a minus and an energy. So the higher the energy, the slower the rate. Similar phenomenon here, two bilayers coming together and then eventually fusing into one another. They have to overcome a barrier. They overcome a barrier and eventually fuse. Most important in overcoming the barrier is the spike protein. If you go back to the top of the slide, you will see the spike on the virus, two brown and one blue, eventually becoming three uh, a trimeric structure here. You can see all of this now joins. It's almost like the glue which brings the virus and the cell together. And all of that happens because of very detailed chemical interactions between the receptor on the cell surface and the spike protein over here. On the bottom right of the slide is the kind of picture which has emerged from studies of influenza virus and the hemagglutinin, which is corresponds to the spike protein of the coronavirus. And you can see all kinds of wonderful events happen before the influenza virus actually enters the cell. So this is known in detail from great, from wonderful crystallographic work, which has been done on influenza by the semaglutinin. Everywhere you will find in these viruses, influenza, corona, these trimeric proteins. And uh, therefore there are models in the literature as to why these trimeric proteins are important and how this fusion process actually happens. So if we go back to the atomic level structure of the spike protein, this is what it now looks like. The spike's very important for recognition. It's held here by the membrane. Little bit of it projects inside. So if we can disrupt any of these, we would be on our way towards controlling the coronavirus. We now have detailed structures of the spike protein. I show you paper which has appeared in March 2020. So we are now getting de atomic level details of almost every component of the coronavirus. And when you get atomic level details, you get more and more detailed picture of the molecule that you want to study and the molecule that you want to try and control. This is the spike protein now. On the left, one molecule. On the right, three molecules in the trimer. Uh, those of you who like looking at these pictures might see that in this complexity, there is also beauty because you can see a uh, wonderful symmetries uh, which emerge in the trimer. But if you just look at one molecule, you can see that a protein chain, it's a long protein chain, and it appears to be composed of many independent domains simply stuck together, linked together. So you can recognize from the five colors that there must be at least five domains. This is the domain which is important. The blue domain is the domain which is important. The dark blue domain 
on the top right is what is important for binding to the cell surface receptor. So anyone who is now targeting this aspect of coronavirus infection needs to understand this very, very well. What is the receptor? Many years ago, it had been established that for Dorothy Hamley's coronavirus 229E, the receptor is a protein on the cell surface called aminopeptidase N. This is a very common protein, plays a number of roles in biology, in physiology. All it does is to cleave peptides from the N terminus, remove one letter at a time from a polypeptide chain. It's a membrane bound enzyme and it has a single transmembrane domain. In 2003, this paper appears that the angiotensin converting enzyme is a functional receptor for the SARS coronavirus. And that's the molecule which is also the receptor for the SARS coronavirus 2, which is now the current infectious agent. So everybody is looking at this. But angiotensin 2 is also an enzyme which breaks peptide bonds. It's, in its function, it is similar to aminopeptidase N. And it turns out that in biology, in cell biology, there are a large number of enzymes which are involved in breaking peptides. Here, this is very important because the molecule angiotensin 2 is responsible for controlling blood pressure. And uh, angiotensin 2 is formed by an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme. And it, it turns out that angiotensin 2 must then be broken down further in order not to have too much of it around. This is control. You need angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And it's the receptor for this molecule, which uh, is the coronavirus receptor, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. So what I have in red on this slide, at the bottom of the slide, is the receptor for the coronavirus. So you can see that what the virus has done is, as viruses evolve, they look at molecules which are on the surface of human cells and eventually find a way of binding to them. A Darwinian evolution eventually selects viruses for their ability to infect. And so we slowly, over a period of time, viruses which are benign today can be transformed into viruses which are fairly dangerous uh, at a later time. Today, all these structures are known, especially in the last three months, there's been an enormous amount of work uh, in China, in America, in Europe, and so on. And many structures are now available, which allow us to look at the interactions in detail. It is at this point that biology begins to give way to chemistry. You now have to look at these interactions the same way that you would look at interactions between molecules in chemistry. And if one is interested in therapeutics, in drugs, one needs to inhibit this interaction. If one is interested in using vaccines, you might have antibodies which inhibit this interaction. So both drugs and vaccines will eventually come only by a deep understanding of all these systems. Now, it turns out that if you have a viral receptor, different coronaviruses bind at different points in the receptor, which is an additional complicating factor. And uh, it is amazing how viruses are able to use a molecule which is essential for the cell and use that molecule to actually enter the cell. The receptor becomes a true Trojan horse once the virus is bound to it. Both the coronavirus receptors are zinc metalloproteases. So there may be some connection here to the metal zinc. Why do we have so many proteases? I thought I would just spend a minute on this to tell you that proteases are necessary for processing peptides. And proteins sometimes are a source of biologically active peptides. One gene can give rise to a protein, which when you break it down, can release many biologically active peptides. The classical example is a molecule called pro-opio melanocortin, which is there in your brain, 
which will now produce all the hormones that sometimes are needed, melanotropins, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, ACTH, beta melanocyte and beta endorphins. All of these are essential for us, pain relief, other kinds of hormonal processes. But you need to chop a protein. So you have all these chopping enzymes and the virus is using a chopping enzyme now as a receptor to enter the cell. Uh, technology has moved very fast. In 2020 now, we have a structure of the coronavirus received now through the receptor binding domain of the coronavirus in a ternary complex. And uh, this structure now gives you all the detail that may be needed to try and rationally approach the problem of inhibition. And there are probably hundreds of scientists in the world now who are in fact uh, looking at this structure very, very carefully. But technology allows you to do all of this today. So coming back to virus cell fusion, the only protein that I've shown you is the protein which sticks out to the virus and which is important for uh, viral entry. So this is now a target for both therapeutic as well as vaccine design. And uh, since we now have a full structure of the spike protein, we have a full structure of the receptor. Now there is all the detail that one needs. The question is, can a therapeutic or a vaccine now emerge from this knowledge. But how many proteins does the coronavirus have? I've taken this from a New York Times article which appeared in April. It's a wonderful article to appear in a newspaper. It has so much technical detail that I think it should be read uh, by scientists in general and by people interested in the coronavirus in particular. But there aren't more than about 16 and maybe another half a dozen, maybe a 20 odd proteins at best in the current infectious agent. Structures of most of these are beginning to be known, although their functions are not known. I have just made this slide from the pictures which appear in this article, which tell you that we are beginning to know what these molecules look like. And you can see the titles, they're wonderful. Mystery protein, cellular saboteur, untagging and cutting, protein scissors, bubble maker, bubble factory, because many things have to happen once the virus enters the cell. It has to uncoat, release the RNA, then the RNA now has to be converted into proteins, and then the whole viral particle has to be packaged once again. And then the cell must burst, releasing all these viral particles which it has manufactured. It's a very complex manufacturing process that happens inside the cell. But we do have some ideas about many of the proteins which are there inside the coronavirus, although all their functions are not yet clearly known. Here, for example, is a protein which is labeled as the escape artist. There are proofreaders, there are cleaners, there are camouflaging proteins. It's remarkable uh, how evolution has actually produced such a complex object, which eventually inside a cell is able now to reproduce. And once it is outside, it is able to infect. And once it is able to infect and reproduce very effectively, it can actually paralyze the world. And therefore, one should look at the coronavirus with a great deal of respect and uh, also try and understand that the drive towards vaccines and the drive towards drugs is not going to be a terribly easy business in the days, months, and even years uh, that lie ahead. This is an understanding which I think is very important for all educated people, because there is a great deal to be said for understanding the virus, for coming to terms with the virus and asking the question, how can we limit the spread of the virus and eventually prevent the virus from very effectively multiplying? At the moment, the only thing that can be done are the kind of uh, methods which are being advanced by the World Health Organization and also by other public health bodies, 
uh, social distancing, masks, uh, general cleanliness, uh, and so on. So I think on that note, I would sort of uh, end my presentation. My last slide only shows you pictures of the two institutions, which I must acknowledge, because they have given me the ability to uh, think about things I'm not an expert in, and also sometimes write about them, and also uh, try and explain them in presentations like this. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sunita and Dr. Libby, could you please start the question and answer session? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, we apologize the YouTube view viewers who faced some initial issues today. Uh, we really apologize for the inconveniences, but at the last, uh, Professor Balram, a lot of uh, positive comments are there from all the, all the viewers from YouTube. So many thank yous are there. And there are some questions which I am reading it out. The first question was posted by uh, Nirmala S. Uh, why can't we use mRNA silencing or RNA interference like we used it for the nematode melodynesia incognitia? Okay. That is yeah. a complex technical question. Um, RNA silencing and all is, uh, in principle, possible in the in vitro experiments. Right now, people are looking for more direct approaches. Uh, uh, two approaches which is very promising. One is the antibody. Uh, if you knew, it would be. Uh, yeah. One approach is the antibody approach, which looked quite promising. Even today, there is a positive report. The other is to try and use angiotensin converting enzyme uh, itself, a soluble form as a way of scavenging viruses. Both of these are actually being used by companies in trials now. I suspect the approach to a vaccine may be much, uh, much further along than anything else. OK, um, there is next question from uh, Kiran Mai Nag. Uh, Sir, sometimes we can get immune if we can have mild uh, one in body. If we have 229E, is there any chance that we get immune against COVID-19? That's actually a wonderful question because that's the kind of speculation huh, that one might have for why the uh, seriousness of the uh, coronavirus spread across India appears to be somewhat less, at least at the moment, as compared to the countries of Europe and the United States. There is little doubt that we would have all been exposed to coronavirus infections in the past. Nobody's ever looked. And uh, I think now maybe people would take more interest in this. Hopefully, that would be one reason why many people are uh, uh, asymptomatic, uh, some people get very, very mild uh, infections, but the statistics are still not there. We do not know whether those numbers are really more in India than in the US or not. But it's a wonderful question. I think it is a question which uh, people, and there are other coronaviruses which infect humans. There's another one called OC43. So there are uh, very uh, The next question is from uh, Veda Vitya M. Can you please explain the structure of coronavirus? Yeah, the co 
Uh, the coronavirus, in simple terms, the coronavirus is a spherical particle. The surface of the spherical particle consists of a bilayer of phospholipids. It's a membrane, just like all our cells. So it's like a little bag with a bilayer membrane. And stuck on this bilayer membrane is the spike protein. It sticks out quite a bit. And that's what gives that corona. Inside, unlike in cells, the volume is very small and proteins and RNA are densely packed. And there's very little else inside the virus. So the virus is really, as Medava said, uh, the viral genome completely packed in protein with a little bit of the phospholipid membrane around. So it's a small particle, spherical particle, a spiky spherical oh. particle. Okay, the next question is from Putul Banerjee. Does the spike protein belong to any super family or family of proteins in eukaryotic cell or taking it further mammalian cell? Can I club it with another question, sir? Why was much emphasis laid on spike protein? This, uh, uh, this is a question from Sattvic. Yeah, uh, no, the spike protein appears to be quite a unique protein. Uh, the spike protein uh, similarities in other places have not been found, but all coronaviruses have the spike protein. There are lots of coronaviruses which infect uh, pigs, cows, dogs, cats, and so on, bats, uh, pangolins. All the coronaviruses resemble, this is why I gave a, pic, a figure of 1150 to 1470 amino acid residues, because there are lots of coronavirus spike proteins. So the spike protein is unique to the coronavirus, that's one. Uh, so much focus is there on the spike protein, that's only my presentation. There are other people who may be focusing on the uh, other proteins of the coronavirus. But even worldwide, there is a great deal of focus on the spike protein because that protein makes contact with the target cell. And that's the contact that you want to inhibit. If you inhibit that contact, you now have an antiviral or you have a vaccine. OK. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question is from Professor Vinod Kumar. Uh, the question is, might lectins be of some use in anti-coronavirus strategies? Could you just read that again? Might uh, lectins be of some use in anti-coronavirus strategies? Lectins. Lectins. Can it be uh, of some use in anti-coronavirus strategies? Might well be. I haven't paid attention to that part of the literature, but the spike protein is heavily glycosylated. And uh, the glycosylation patterns are now known. And your question is whether you can use a lectin, which will now sort of scavenge the coronavirus. Or maybe in some other diagnostic kind of thing, you might well use it. Quite possible. I don't know is the answer. Okay, so next question is from Shanti Matthew. If the vaccine is ready by August, as announced by media, can it have any side effects on humans, as it is too early to test on humans? I don't think any vaccine is going to be ready by August. Uh, it's most unrealistic time scale. And uh, when a vaccine is ready, one needs to test. And testing vaccines is not very easy. Testing therapeutics, the protocols are somewhat simpler than the test for vaccines. Because right now, for example, in Oxford, where the vaccine trials were going on, uh, they have a problem. There are fewer people getting infected now in England. So you must have lots of people being getting infected and passing the infection around. Now to have a group of people who you can now enroll for a trial and ask whether they would be infected or not. And this is a long drawn out process. Uh, An August timescale, uh, we're already in July. 
And you know well that nothing will happen on a time scale of uh, a month or five weeks. I think in some ways uh, th these media reports simply mislead people. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question from YouTube is from Miss Chandra Kumari. Uh, does coronavirus spread through the cuts present in the human body? I'm also clubbing another question. Uh, is the virus permeable through placenta? See, I don't think there is any evidence right now that the virus spreads in any way other than by getting in through the nasal tract. Uh, there isn't any direct evidence. You know, people have worried about it spreading through water, for instance, and through the gut. There's no evidence for it directly going through the blood. But this uh, mother-child kind of transmission, I do not know. I have not uh, been reading that kind of literature. There might well be. Today, for example, I saw a report uh, on uh, breast milk as a possible uh, source of uh, coronavirus inhibition. So I do not know. Okay. Uh, thank you for the answer. Next question is uh, from uh, Durai Pandi. Can we use mass spectrometry to detect coronavirus instead of RT-PCR? Absolutely, you can. And there are already papers which have come out which try to detect uh, peptide fragments of coronavirus proteins. And there's a method which has been published in the literature. But I think this is a rather sophisticated method which would be difficult to implement immediately in India. Probably could be done, but it could be done only in very limited places. So as a general diagnostic in the middle of the pandemic, I do not know. But yes, there is an aspect of a treatment. Eventually, when that happens, that will be much faster and more reliable. OK, uh, thank you for that answer. The next question is from uh, Guy3. Is SARS cov 2 a mixture of two virus? Uh, when you say a mixture of two viruses, this is now a generic term. Now. Many mutations of this virus have now been detected, and there's a site on the in, uh, on the internet where this data is now being fed, and anybody can look at it. There are a number of mutations which have already been seen in this virus, and people are trying to understand whether any of these mutations either enhances or diminishes infectivity. There is one specific mutation which appears to enhance infectivity. But it's not yet clear. There's only one paper which has appeared so far. But it is only one virus, but many mutant forms. It's in a way like saying that uh, your genome and mine will be different, but we are both human beings, only. one species. Uh, the next question is from Subhashri. Uh, there were certain assumptions about the drug hydroxychloroquine. Can you okay. throw some light on this theme? I can't really throw light on it, except the reasons why hydroxychloroquine was first mm -hmm. used appear to be because hydroxychloroquine interferes with some kind of inside the cell lysosomal protea uh, uh, processing of proteins. And since the coronavirus has to enter the cell and then uncoat, and you need proteases acting on this, I think the speculation was there that hydroxychloroquine might work. And since it's a drug which is approved for malaria and for other things, uh, there was a trial in France. And the trial, when the trial work was published, uh, there were immediate objections on the way in which the trial was conducted. But since it was positive, I think this was picked up. And then once the American president began to tout hydroxychloroquine, it became very popular. But I think now the weight of evidence is that hydroxychloroquine doesn't seem to be doing, uh, it's neither doing good and it possibly is doing no harm. 
it may harm some patients who have already some other problem. So it is something that a clinician should worry about. Okay, thank you, sir. Next question is from Ramapriya. It is said that there are L and S strain of coronavirus. If a person is affected with the S strain, is there a chance of getting again an attack of L strain? No, this I do not know. You know, what people are talking about here is that whether once you're infected with the, with the coronavirus strain, are you now going to be susceptible to infection with another? It's not even known whether you're susceptible to infection by the same coronavirus strain. See, the problem with coronaviruses and rhinoviruses is that Look at rhinoviruses, which cause cold. Do you get immune? No, your immunity doesn't last very long. So even if you generate antibodies, the next viral strain is slightly different. This is why there is no cold vaccine. Similarly, there is no common influenza vaccine. Every year there is a new influenza vaccine, which American companies produce. So, the same things likely to happen to the coronavirus also. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Next question is from Vijay Sri Achar. Was there any molecule inhibited the SARS CoV 1 entering the human cell? If yes, can that be looked for SARS CoV 2 with some modifications? I don't believe that there were any good inhibitors of viral entry. There were other molecules which people tried, which work on processes inside the cell. One of them is the molecule that everybody is looking at now, remdesivir. So those kinds of antivirals uh, may have some, some effect. But there is no, as far as I know, no inhibitor which uh, was found at that time. See, what happened there was in SARS-CoV-1, and this is a lesson for everybody. It was a virulent virus. It killed many people very quickly. It was brought into control by public health measures, which were possible only because it happened in a remote area. But research on it, which went on wonderfully well for a few years, was not pursued because pharmaceutical companies, governments, all of them were reluctant to fund this research. Now that you have learned a lesson, maybe in future, but I don't think, usually nobody learns any lessons. You know. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the next question from Google, sorry, uh, from YouTube is from Nitya. Can you tell a little bit more on zinc in COVID-19 infection, sir, since zinc supplements are given as therapy? I have no idea. There are people I know who have said that zinc supplements should be given uh, as therapy. Zinc has so many uh, roles that uh, I do not know. I don't think a zinc supplement is going to do you any harm. Uh, but I don't know whether it does any good. The next question is from uh, Miller Samson. Is it possible to block the ACE2 receptor so that we have to prevent the entry of coronavirus? Also, can antisense RNA block the replication of coronavirus? Yes, I think this is the area of trying to block AC2 is one where there's a huge amount of work right now. How to block AC2. And uh, there's a other very interesting work where people have taken AC2, the soluble form of AC2, made the recombinant protein has been produced. And the hope is that if you inject this protein into humans, it will scavenge the coronavirus and prevent it from... Uh, binding to the cell. So the, but there are many problems in this of how to deliver it to the right places and so on. I don't know or I haven't seen, so that's not really an answer. I don't know about antisense therapies which anybody is looking at. I don't know. I haven't come across anything. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Naveen Chandra. What is the role of T cells in COVID-19 control? 
in COVID-19 control. Well, in immunity teams without T cells, nothing will really happen. And uh, I think a lot of our natural immunity that we have are these immune responses. Many people are probably immune to this coronavirus because otherwise they would not be completely asymptomatic. And uh, they must be having it under control. There must also be people who are infected but clear the virus very quickly. These, I think, will happen only when we have lots of epidemiological studies of people who have been infected, people who have uh, tested positive but are asymptomatic. But I don't think right now much of that is being done in India. Because we are so caught up in the pandemic right now, right in the middle of it, and so difficult to do anything now. Thank you, sir. Okay, next question is from Susan Phillips. How common is this kind of zoonotic transmission of viruses? Do we count only the ones that cause human infection? Are there more transmissions like this uh, that fly under the ra radar because they don't cause serious infection. I think you've given your answer. I think zoonotic transmission may be much more common than we think. We don't know how many relatively mild infection causing viruses uh, have actually infected us and we've uh, passed on. Uh, look at Bangalore itself, no, uh, at every year people will say you're infected with, you've got a viral infection, but nobody knows which viral infection. And other than uh, dengue, which has, uh, and chikungunya, which have characteristic symptoms, many other viral fevers come and go. And nobody really knows what, uh, what was the causative issue. So I think lots of viruses are under the radar. Okay. Uh, so next question is from Katyaini. Antibodies against COVID-19, IgM, IgG, which signifies higher immunity? I am not sure about the answer to this question. You will have to look it up. I don't know. Okay, sir. So, uh, next question is from Kavya. So, in your opinion, NSP12 RDRP being target for therapeutics over spike protein and also some light on remdesivir. See, I don't, uh, this is again an area, I have not looked at remdesivir very uh, closely, so I can't really tell you anything sensible about uh, them decibel and uh, how effective it is going to be here. It's only what I generally read that uh, them decibel is being recommended. So this is again not a question that I can really answer. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, it's a combined uh, similar kind of question by Mezba, uh, Sumangala, Dr. Sh uh, Sushma, uh, Tami. Them, Hida and Jancy Angel. Uh, they were asking like similar kind of questions, so I clubbed it. Some people who have recovered could have acquired uh, immunity against the virus. Can the antibodies produced in the body of the recovered be transferred to the infected and can this be effective? Can you please throw some light on the herd immunity? Why it is taking long time to get medicine? And what's the main reason for not finding vaccine? Okay, many questions. <laughs> I'll try to answer one by one, and if I forget something, you remind me. Uh, you would have read in the newspapers about plasma therapy, and where people are struggling in uh, ICUs and so on, plasma therapy has been advocated, which actually involves taking plasma from a patient who has recovered. And in Delhi, they are doing this quite a lot now. Uh, and infusing this into the patient. This is transferring antibodies which one person has generated 
and hope that this will help uh, another patient. So yes, plasma therapy is a possibility which has always been discussed in viral infections. And in the current scenario, it is being used. But different groups have reported different results. But there have been some people who appear to have recovered quite well after plasma therapy. But this is ongoing. The second was why is it taking so long to get a vaccine? I think here you should just ask yourself the question, how many viral vaccines do we have? We have two viral vaccines which everybody has commonly uh, heard, smallpox, which is no longer given because smallpox is eradicated. But this is effectively an 18th century vaccine. Then you have polio, which is a mid 20th century vaccine. Then you have very few other effective vaccines which have come because it's difficult to generate vaccines to viruses because of mutations. Uh, so I think the vaccine is being over projected, but we don't have an alternative. The same problem with antivirals. You have lots of antibacterials. You have antibacterials, antibiotics, which you take, which are broad spectrum antibiotics and uh, they kill bacteria. You can ask how many broad spectrum antivirals are there? You'll find there are none. So you just try. So remdesivir belongs in this category. So viruses have been somewhat more difficult to control than uh, bacteria. Uh, thank you, sir. Next question is uh, by Shobha Jayana. The drug prescribed for malaria is suggested as anti-coronavirus for the time being. Any justification, sir? I think very clearly what uh, most international bodies suggest is that there is no justification. But uh, there are still people who propose that one should take chloroquine. So I guess people are taking chloroquine. It's, uh, I don't think it's going to help very much. At least the literature doesn't seem to suggest that it's going to help anything. OK, uh, the next question is uh, by Jyoti Nanda Kumar. Why can't a weakened virus be used for immunity? Looks simple, but what are the complications involved? Well, that is the vaccine that you are uh, wanting by August 15th. That's the weakened virus vaccine. So if you have whole viral vaccines, one has to be very careful that uh, you don't cause infection. Eventually. So you need a lot of studies to make sure that uh, you're able to get a vaccine which is absolutely safe. So safety is something that needs to be established. That is the approach. But beacon virus vaccines are very difficult to get, actually. It takes a very long time. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Um, so uh, can we continue with the questions? There are a few more questions. You can. You want. Yes. OK. Next question is from uh, Aruna HK. Uh, mutation rate of virus being high, would a specific target vaccine candidate be effective? In the case of the coronavirus, I think virologists feel that the mutation rates are much lower than other viruses. And therefore, there is a chance that the coronavirus vaccine would be more effective maybe than the influenza virus vaccine. Okay. And certainly much more effective than, let's say, you had a vaccine for some other viral disease. So. One hopes that that is true. OK, thank you, sir. Next question is from Supreet. 
uh, if coronaviruses are known for so many years, don't we have vaccines produced based on the S protein? If yes, can they be used for COVID-19? No, there are no vaccines produced now which can be used for COVID-19 as yet. Now, everything that is being tried is in an experimental stage. Uh, uh, Joyce, ma'am, uh, do you think we should continue with more question and answer round? I think uh, we will uh, stop here. And okay. uh, I think Joyce, we can. Uh, sure, sir. Sure. Yeah, thank you, sir.